Let's talk about sepsis. Well, we're looking at a framework designed for exactly that today. Okay. It's called the Sepsis Chain of Survival. And importantly, it comes from a comprehensive publication in Critical Care Medicine, Volume 53. Critical Care Medicine, Volume 53. Got it. And what it does is it essentially takes lessons from the um, highly successful chain of survival model used for cardiac arrest. Right. I'm familiar with that one. And adapts them directly for sepsis management. It's a really smart adaptation. So the core idea is that it fundamentally recognizes sepsis as a true time-sensitive emergency. Okay. And that demands seamless coordination, not just in the hospital, but across the entire patient journey. The entire journey. You mean like from the very beginning? Exactly. From, say, early recognition out in the community all the way through post-discharge recovery. It's a continuum. That sounds incredibly comprehensive. And the framework outlines six interconnected links. Is that right? Yes, six links. Like a chain, literally. Can you break those down for us? Yeah. Let's start with link one, awareness and prevention. Absolutely. So link one, awareness and prevention. This is all about education. For who? Patients? Providers? Both, actually. Educating the public and healthcare providers. It covers recognizing early signs of infection. Promoting things like vaccination programs, which are hugely important. And effective infection control measures in healthcare settings. So prevention is really the first line of defense here. It's our most powerful tool, really. Think about a solid vaccination program that can seriously cut down on community-acquired sepsis cases hitting your emergency room. Makes sense. Okay, link two. Link two is early recognition and call for help. This means someone spotting those warning signs of sepsis quickly. And then doing what? And then immediately activating the right care pathways, whether right. that happens in the community, like a clinic, or within the hospital. Oh, okay. And there's a real emphasis here on clear danger signs, borrowing from... Uh, successful pediatric emergency protocols, making it simple and actionable. Got it. Danger signs. What's link three? Link three, continuous source control. This one's about rapidly finding and um, managing the source of the infection itself. Like what kind of management? Could be different things. Maybe surgical intervention is needed or removing an infected medical device or drainage procedures. Uh, okay. It's a component that honestly can sometimes get overlooked in the initial rush, but it's absolutely essential for effective treatment. Right, you have to stop the source. What about link four? Link four is appropriate fluids, oxygen, and antibiotics. Now these might sound like basics. Yeah, the cornerstone. Exactly. But the framework really stresses doing them right and fast. It highlights using resource appropriate fluid strategies. Meaning not just flooding everyone with fluids. Right, tailoring it. <laughs> and it underscores the um, absolute necessity of getting antimicrobial therapy started early, ideally within that first hour, the golden hour. That one hour target is key. Okay, link five. Link five is called critical care without walls. This is about delivering intensive interventions flexibly across different settings. So not necessarily in the intensive care unit? Precisely. It acknowledges that optimal sepsis management might need to happen outside traditional ICU boundaries. Yeah. This is especially relevant in, say, resource-limited environments. That idea, critical care without walls, is really interesting, especially thinking about those resource challenges. Can you give a quick example? How might that work practically? Sure. Uh, imagine a patient deteriorating fast with suspected sepsis in a remote clinic. Okay. Care without walls could mean empowering that clinic staff through maybe telemedicine links to specialists, using remote monitoring tech, and having clear protocols for rapid transport. So they can start key interventions sooner. Exactly. Getting those early antibiotics and fluids going before the patient even gets to a big hospital, it's about bringing the principles of critical care to the patient wherever they happen to be. That clarifies it nicely. What's the final link in this chain then? Link six, post-sepsis care and return to community. This focuses on comprehensive support after the acute phase. It addresses things like post-intensive care syndrome or PICS. PICS, what does that involve? Well, PICS can cover a whole range of issues. Cognitive problems, chronic pain, significant muscle weakness that often follows severe illness. It's tough. Wow, well, yeah. So this link includes planning for rehabilitation needs and also providing thorough education for the family. Support for the long haul. And you mentioned this is often neglected. Unfortunately, yes. It's often the most overlooked link in current care pathways. And without it, you see higher readmission rates and just a massive impact on long-term quality of life for survivors. So it's not just about surviving the sepsis event itself. No, it's about achieving a truly successful outcome long-term. This link is fundamental for that. That breakdown really paints the picture. So for the clinicians listening, 
What are the direct advantages, the biggest sort of clinical implications of adopting this framework day to day? Well, there are several big ones. First, it encourages system thinking. It forces a shift away from only focusing on acute management right. to looking at the entire continuum, prevention, recovery, everything in between. Okay, systems thinking, what else? Second, resource adaptability. The model isn't rigid, it can scale. You can apply its principles in a big, well-resourced hospital or a small community health center. That flexibility is important. Very. And third, it boosts the quality improvement focus, each of those six links. They give you measurable targets for your institution's sepsis programs. You can see where you're strong, where you need work. Measurable targets, that's useful. Now, it sounds great, but implementing something this comprehensive, it must have challenges, right? Yeah. What are the main hurdles systems should anticipate? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Challenges exist. A big one is interdisciplinary coordination. Getting everyone on the same page. Exactly. Success really depends on alignment across different services, emergency teams, hospitalists, intensivists, community providers, you name it. That sounds simple on paper, but... But in practice, in the heat of the moment, that coordination is often where things can break down. Communication gaps, different priorities. Yeah, I can see that. Is there maybe one quick win strategy, something a team could try, say, this week to improve coordination, even just a little? That's a great question. Um, one simple but effective thing is establishing a quick sepsis huddle. Yeah, maybe a shift change or during daily rounds, just a brief focused chat, making sure everyone involved, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, maybe knows the status of sepsis patients, what tests are pending, the immediate next steps. Builds that shared awareness. Exactly. Shared awareness and accountability. It's a small step, but it helps. Good tip. What other hurdles besides coordination? Well, educational investment is another. Yeah. You need sustained commitment and resources for both public awareness campaigns and ongoing provider training. It doesn't happen overnight. Resources and commitment. Got it. Anything else? And finally, technology integration. Things like electronic health record alerts, early warning systems, prediction algorithms. They can definitely help with recognition, uh, but implementing them effectively requires careful planning, workflow integration, and making sure they don't lead to alert fatigue. It's a balancing act. Right. Technology is a tool, not a magic bullet. So this sepsis chain of survival, is it meant to replace existing guidelines like the surviving sepsis campaign, or how does it fit in? No, that's a key point. It absolutely does not replace existing clinical guidelines. Okay. Think of it more as an organizational framework. It's designed to significantly enhance the implementation of those evidence-based guidelines. Ah, so it helps put the guidelines into practice more effectively? Precisely. Its real strength lies in systematically coordinating all the different pieces of evidence-based care across that whole patient journey. It's not about one single new intervention. It provides the structure, the scaffolding. That's a perfect way to put it. The scaffolding to make sure existing best practices are delivered cohesively and reliably every time. That really underscores how vital communication and process are, just as much as the individual medical actions themselves. And as the source itself emphasizes, you know, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. A powerful reminder. It really is. If one part fails, the whole effort can be compromised. So for everyone listening, especially you healthcare providers, think about your own setting. Where might the weakest link be in your current sepsis care process? Yeah, take a moment to reflect on that. What's maybe one specific action, even a small one, you could take this week to strengthen that particular link? It all comes down to improving patient outcomes through better coordination. Absolutely. We really encourage you to reflect on this framework, this chain of survival, and think about its potential impact in your daily practice.